Jack Smith is illegal. That's what Donald Trump and his team finally say in the classified documents case. They are picking up on an argument we've talked a lot about here from the former attorney general, Ed Meese, and two college professors. That some would say are not big fans of Trump, but they are not big fans of illegal special counsels. And that's what their argument was. And Trump is now picking this up and running with it, saying that Jack Smith and his entire team, they are not lawfully constitutionally appointed. He's not really a special counsel. He's just a private citizen. Other special counsels are you. U.S. attorneys. And you know, a U.S. attorney gets appointed by the president and the Senate confirms them. It's an official position that is established by the law. But Jack Smith is not a U.S. attorney. He was not appointed by the president. And so his entire position is arguably illegal. That's what Trump's team is saying. And we've been waiting for them to adopt this argument. And now it's here. And they filed it in a good location. This is in Judge Cannon's courtroom, not in Judge Chutkin's. And so the likelihood that she'll give this its time of day is much higher. And so let's get right into it. This is the filing. Donald Trump submits a motion to dismiss the Florida classified documents case indictment, the whole thing, because Jack has been unlawfully appointed and his funding is not valid. Pay that money back, Jack. Judge Cannon's courtroom, West Palm Beach, Southern District of Florida. Here is what Trump's team is explaining to us. Dear Judge Cannon, President Trump respectfully submits this motion to dismiss this indictment based on the unlawful appointment of Jack Smith in violation of the appointments clause and the appropriations clause. Here's why. They say, your honor, the appointments clause under the constitution does not permit Merrick Garland or the attorney general to appoint without Senate confirmation, a private citizen and like-minded political ally to wield the prosecutorial power of the United States, which is what they did. They just go picked up Jack from the international criminal court. And as such, because he is a private citizen, Jack Smith lacks the authority to prosecute this action. Now that is a serious problem for the rule of law. Whatever one may think of former President Trump or the conduct that Smith challenges in the underlying case. And that is directly a quote from Ed Meese. We've read several of the Ed Meese filings here. They're excellent. If you haven't watched those yet, I'd encourage you to go check those out because they're good. And these law professors, Calabresi and Lawson, they all say the same. Jack does not have the authority to conduct this. Doesn't matter what you think about Trump. You can't have rando prosecutors just prosecuting people in this country. This is an issue of first impression impression in the 11th circuit. And it requires judge Cannon. This is the classified documents case that the superseding indictment go bye-bye be dismissed. Here are the facts. All right, Cannon. They say on November 18th, Merrick mayor appointed Smith as quote, special counsel with the purported authority to quote, prosecute crimes arising from the investigation into Trump. They put it in an order. They wrote it. Now, soon after his appointment, the DOJ Merrick launched a web page for Smith. Huh? They put him online. You have a headshot check similar to web pages that the DOJ maintains for different components of the department. Huh. And that links to statements and expenditures by Smith's office. And they're spending a lot of money, a lot more money than they spent in the Robert Hur report for Joe Biden. They link this over here, justice.gov slash D9 slash 21, all the things, Jack Smith's office. They say U.S. Department of Justice, special counsel's office, Smith's statement of expenditures, find it at that link. Hmm. Yeah. So he's spending a lot of money. He's got a whole office. That's weird. Did anyone have the power to give him that? The statements of expenditures, those summarize the financial activity of special counsel, John L. Smith. And it further provides that as an organization within the DOJ, the special counsel's office is required to comply with the rules, the regulations, the procedures, the practices, and the policies of the DOJ. Hmm. They lay out that little factual background for us. They have a website and a webpage for him. But here's the law, Canon. They say Jack violates the appointments clause, saying the constitution vests all executive power in a president. Where does the power emanate from? Where is the authority? Constitution, as always, we start there. The executive power is vested in a president and the president must take care that the laws be faithfully executed. Now the appointments clause, it requires that all federal offices, like the one Jack has, not otherwise provided for in the constitution, I mean, not written in the original document, every other office, it must be established by law. What is the entity that creates the law? Congress, they write the law, the president and forces the law and the courts say what the law is. That's by Congress. Now the appointments clause, it requires that any appointment be with the advice and the consent of the Senate. Again, the constitution, it's all there, black and white. It follows then that to properly establish on federal office, like the one they're claiming Jack has, Congress must enact it. Very logical, very tight argument right there. Here's where it comes from. Here's how it works. One paragraph, easy. You'd think even Chuck can figure it out. But the necessary and proper clause authorizes Congress to create federal offices 
offices to exercise that power. So Congress can create those other offices. Article 1 says the Congress shall have the power to make all laws, which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foreign powers and so on. But if you look through all of the laws, there is, however, no statute that establishes the office of Jack Smith or the special counsel. So as a result, because neither the Constitution allow for it and because Congress has created no office of the special counsel, Jack Smith's appointment is invalid and any prosecutorial power he seeks to wield is ultra virus outside of out of bounds, not allowed. Sorry. The DOJ and the statutes that they rely on. Okay. If the Congress didn't pass anything and the constitution doesn't say it, he's got no authority. And so what they've done is they've cobbled together a bunch of other provisions. So like, well, this one kind of says something similar about, and this one's a little bit over here, a little bit over here. We're just going to cobble those together and therefore, boom, we got power. But they say no. They say, sorry, the statutes that the DOJ is relying on. No, they do not vest the attorney general with an appointment authority. Doesn't happen. Saying Jack Smith is not an officer under the statutes that are cited by Garland. At best, he's an employee. At best. They say each executive agency, military department, and government of the DC may employ employees. But in appointing Smith, Garland relied on regulations that came out from Janet Reno called the Reno Regulations. She said that an attorney general may appoint outside special counsel to assume responsibility for a matter. And she's using the Code of Federal Regulations for that. However, the Reno Regulations are not the type of law that can establish a federal office because the Appointments Clause dictates only Congress can create a federal office. And she just made it up. Like, in other words, Congress never passed a law that says that. There are regulations that interpret the laws, and she's relying on those which they can change. This is the same thing that Joe Biden is doing with student loans right now. Court said you can't do it. Congress hasn't dealt with it. So he's just changing the rules to say, well, I can move this around. And it's all unconstitutional, right? As the SCOTUS has said. Now, the Reno regulations, they cite as authority these subsections, 509, 510. We've talked a lot about them. But the order appointing Smith cites each of these statutes except 301. Hmm. Reno cites all of those plus 301, but Jack does not cite 301. Hmm. However, none of these statutes, none of them that Jack cites as his power, none of them have authority for special counsel. Section 301 is a general provision for regulations that they can issue for executive department heads, has nothing to do with creating an office. 301, it's a general authorization for appointment of officers. Reading it as the general authorization would make everything else irrelevant. If 301 allows you to do all of that, well, then all of the other provisions are irrelevant. Everything else would be superfluous. Now, of course, sections 509, 510, these relate to the authority from DOJ officers. What can they do? But they don't authorize new officers or new offices. Like, it's just like, what can you do with current people? 515 through 519 do not authorize any creation of a special counsel. It talks about the powers of an officer or an attorney already appointed under law, but it doesn't give the power to appoint a private citizen. It's not in there. It's just a mere jurisdictional allocation for duly appointed officers. For example, pursuant to this, in 2003, here's a good example, the attorney general appointed Patrick Fitzgerald. Okay, he used section 515. Patrick Fitzgerald was a Senate-confirmed U.S. attorney from Illinois, and he served as special counsel when he was investigating Dick Cheney, Valerie Plame, and that whole scandal. So as long as you're a Senate-confirmed U.S. attorney, it works. But guess what? Jack is not. 515B is not a grant of authority to hire new officers. The statute is limited to attorneys retained under authority of the DOJ. Now, such an attorney must be commissioned as a special assistant or a special attorney, but not a special counsel. And thus, those sections assume that attorneys will be specially appointed by the attorney general under law and specifically retained here. But those provisions don't occur or confer any authority to create an office or to appoint an officer. Similarly, these other provisions that they rely on, they concern the internal allocation of authority for existing people, but no authority to create or appoint new officers. And all of these things don't apply. Section 518 addresses the power to argue cases in court. 519 says that the attorney general can supervise litigation. 543 does not allow appointments unless it's for tribal prosecutors, as we've talked about. Now, Garland didn't cite that, but rather Smith claims to have the authority to exercise the plenary investigative and prosecutorial power without the direction or supervision of a superior officer as required by law. So again, this is something that is not uncommon in the law. They call it a penumbra, like an umbrella of rights. And we get a lot of our privacy rights from this. It's the idea that you read a bunch of things and from that, it's like, okay, like just makes sense in there. Like the founders didn't say it, but it kind of makes sense since we put it in there. And you can have your debate about that, you know, or not. The right to privacy and all those things really come from that concept. But it is like they're doing 
the same thing with statutes to try to create a power that is obvious that doesn't exist. So Garland also cited 533, which is from the FBI. And because the introductory language of 533 relates to the appointment of officials rather than officers, it's not a general authorization to appoint officers. So nice try. And finally, if you read that section to instill limitless inferior officer appointment, then they could just appoint whatever they want and nothing else would matter. Other provisions say that you create offices. So for example, section 504 creates the deputy AG. 505 creates the solicitor general. 506 creates assistant attorney generals. 541, the law. It details the U.S. attorneys. We have FBI, U.S. attorneys, marshal service, U.S. trustees, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. All of them are listed. Special counsel's office is not. And so in that context, it does not stand a reason that they just allowed the AG to create this out of thin air. Congress put the other ones in the law and special counsel's not there. Now, Nixon, the government cites to the case of Nixon. They say, well, Nixon says that we can do this. And they just say, no, they never even brought this up in Nixon. Nixon, the case was focused on the president's assertion of executive immunity. It wasn't challenging the process of why they were there. Thus, Nixon's court and their uh, bare bones analysis of this authority doesn't settle this case. And further, Nixon characterized the special prosecutor as a subordinate officer. But Garland said specifically, Jack Smith doesn't work for anybody. Okay, Garland declared that Smith was intended to promote independence and that they have insisted that there has been no coordination with the Biden administration, right? It's been non-existent. So if Smith is a subordinate officer, then these public assertions are false because Smith serves at the pleasure of the attorney general and President Biden, who is exercising his authority to authority, oversee the prosecution of his political rival and leading candidate into 2024. So you can't have it both ways. Either he works for you and you're prosecuting your political opponent, or he doesn't and he's illegal and he's unlawfully appointed. I think either way he's unlawfully appointed. But for all these reasons, Smith's position was not established by the law. The authority he attempts to employ far exceeds the power that's exercisable by a non-superior officer. Okay, if he is an employee, then he can't just prosecute someone on his own because he's not a U.S. attorney, right, who's appointed and confirmed, saying Congress has not cloaked him with any of this. And so therefore, Jack Smith's actions are ultra virus and they are not allowed and they must be dismissed. Now, similarly, all that government money that Jack has been grifting, it's all unlawful. Joe Biden's DOJ is also paying for this politically motivated prosecution of Trump and it is prosecuting his political rival off the books without accountability or authorization. Rather than funding the special counsel's office through the ordinary budget process where Congress has a say, Jack Smith is drawing on a permanent indefinite appropriation. Like, where's his money coming from? That by its terms and under the Reno regulations is not even available to him. Thus, he's also violating the appropriations clause. And like the appointments clause defect, the appropriations clause violation is also an issue of first impression in this 11th circuit. Now here's the background. The Independent Counsel Act. The Ethics and Government Act of 1978 established a procedure whereby the Attorney General at their request, this is no longer law, but they had a special counsel, a special panel of three federal judges, and they would appoint a prosecutor and they would define the scope of the investigation. Now that law was repeatedly reauthorized and it was later renamed the Independent Special Counsel Act. Independent Counsel Act. In 1983, Congress renamed the special prosecutor as Independent Counsel. But then in 1987, Congress created a permanent indefinite appropriation, whatever that means, right? Endless money to pay all necessary expenses and prosecutions by the Independent Counsel. So they created this entity, gave this entity a bunch of money and a permanent indefinite appropriation is one that remains available for specified purposes without any additional congressional action. Now, a committee report relating that underscored that Congress has always been wanting to fund independent counsel that would be completely independent from the DOJ. That's why they gave him that money, right? So there was this entity called independent counsel. They did get funded by Congress, but then something happened. In 1999, Congress let the Independent Counsel Act expire, due in large part to bipartisan concern that unlimited budgets were leading to political witch hunts. They were just going after everybody. At a House Judiciary Committee, Deputy Attorney General Eric Holder, he explained that resource constraints are a needed check on prosecutorial overreach. He said the act vests immense prosecutorial power as someone who, like Bill Barr stated, is not subject to the same oversight. And independent counsels are largely insulated from meaningful budget processes. And it eliminates the incentive to show restraint in the exercise of prosecutorial power. If you give them unlimited money that's unaccountable, that they can just have, you know, they don't have to report to Congress for or anything. There's no oversight. And Fannie, like other
other prosecutors just go on vacations with that endless funnel of money. So this provides an impetus to investigate the most trivial matter. Eric Holder said this, Obama's guy. You can investigate the most trivial matters to an unwarranted extreme and just keep going because there's an endless supply of money. Now that point was echoed by other senators like Mitch McConnell and Chris Dodd. Everybody was saying this. So to address this concern, the DOJ recommended letting the Independent Counsel Act expire. They instead wanted to use lawyers appointed within the DOJ framework. Tammy Baldwin, then a House Judiciary Committee member, pressed Holder on what safeguards they would have. Holder's answers is at the crux of this case. He says, you know, if you had special prosecutors who operated within the framework of the DOJ, you would not have the kinds of concerns that some people have expressed about expenditures. That would be a part of the department and part of the department's budget. So then Congress allowed that statute to lapse. The DOJ then said, well, we still want this. So they issued the Reno regulation soon thereafter, but the DOJ never delivered on Holder's assurance. Special counsel's expenditures, like Jack's, have not become a part of the department's budget. And as here, they continue to be funded through a permanent, indefinite appropriation that's reserved for independent counsels, not for Jack. Now, the day after that the Independent Counsel Act expired, the Reno regulations took effect. The most significant change, according to the Congressional Research Service, is the overall degree of ultimate control and the authority that the AG is to exercise over the special counsel in comparison with the independent counsel and former regulations that authorize the Watergate special prosecutors. So for example, under the Independent Counsel Act, the prosecutor was selected by a three-panel judge created within the U.S. Court of Appeals in D.C. So it's separate. But pursuant to Janet Reno, special counsels are selected by and they owe their jobs to the Attorney General. And so here, Jack Smith's expenditures have not become a part of the DOJ budget like they said they would. Instead, the Biden administration is funding Jack's office via the permanent indefinite appropriation that's not for them. It's only available to independent counsel under the law. It was appointed pursuant to the Independent Counsel Act or other law. Smith is not an independent counsel, but the nearly $13 million of money that Smith spent in 2023 alone with no accountability is more than 10% of the annual budgets of the DOJ's Tax and Environmental and Natural Resources Division. Lot of money. 13 million. And it's just from Biden. Just free money. Here, have some more. Have some more. So the Reno regulations strip prosecutorial independence that had been previously conferred by the Independent Council. The court in Stone ignored the significance of the Reno regulations and relied on an atextual interpretation of this code to reason that the provision served as an independent basis for Mueller's appointment and other law for purposes of his access to the indefinite appropriation. So some of this has been litigated. Now, for the reasons stated above, 515 cannot sustain the weight that the court placed upon it. It refers to attorneys appointed by the AG under the law, which requires an independent statutory basis for that appointment. There was no such basis supporting Mueller's activities, and there was none supporting Jack's. Therefore, this court should reject that analysis. Now, the significance of the Reno regulations is also illustrated by the Government Accountability Office and their analysis relating to Patrick Fitzgerald. In 2004, the DOJ justified Fitzgerald's access to the money in connection with his appointment as special counsel. Their focus was on indicia of independence about Fitzgerald, and they concluded that independence conferred by the delegation of authority of special counsel is consistent with the fair reading of independent counsel. But unlike Fitzgerald, who was actually Senate confirmed and a U.S. attorney, the terms of Garland's order make Jack Smith an outside attorney who used to work at the DOJ, subject to the Reno regulations. Thus, pursuant to the order, Smith is not independent. And therefore, if the DOJ were spending money on that, that'd be a violation of him. And because Jack Smith lacks the sufficient independence to get that money, he should not be permitted to access permanent, indefinite appropriations. This defect serves as another basis for dismissal. Amazing. And so, for the foregoing reasons, Todd Blanche, Christopher Keyes say here, Trump respectfully asks that this court dismiss the superseding indictment pursuant to the appointments clause and pursuant to the appropriations clause. And so another motion, boy, we have been waiting for this one and they are anchoring this in on the record. And this is at the lower level court, which means Jack Smith is going to have to respond to this and address it. The other filings we've seen from Ed Meese have been amicus briefs and Jack Smith has largely gone on and ignored those. But Jack Smith will respond to this and then Trump will issue a reply to that. So we're going to see a nice back and forth on this issue as Jack Smith scrambles to justify his existence. No money, Jack. No office, Jack. No prosecutorial powers. He's going to say, I'm a real boy. And we'll see what he comes up with and what his so-called
called prosecutors say in response, but we've been waiting for this one, my friends, and we're going to be here to continue to cover this. It could result in Cannon saying, yeah, you know what? You're right. The whole thing has to go now. And this will be memorialized and probably appealed and we'll be here continuing to cover it. So thanks for joining us on this one. Don't forget to check out some of the links. We've got some amazing stuff happening in the description below. We've got watcherlodge.com, amazing free events coming up. So go sign up for that, including our political Zen wellness event, where we're going to clear out some mental turbidity in the future. RobertGovea.com if you want to check out the PDF, including this one. We also have our members only community at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. We do streams in the morning, we do Saturday shows, and we'd love to have you join us. And we'd love to see you back here on the next one.